Hi, friends online. And yeah, welcome everybody to the San Francisco Dharma Collective, the Well of Being. Really delighted to be here with you all and Coco, the dog, for friends online who can't see. We have a dog. I know, it's, don't, don't be too jealous. Um, but uh, yeah, we are making our way through the first part of this three-part beautiful um, text on the Guide to the Bodhisattva Way of Life. And if this is your first time here, no problem. And we will kind of continue to kind of revisit the core themes as well as deepen uh, in our practice with them. The very pith way to describe this book and these teachings is it is instructions for how we live with an open heart when the world is on fire. How do we become warriors of compassion when it is very easy to succumb to despair and blame and overwhelm. And this was written in the 8th century. So, you know, I think uh, suffice to say this is not a new condition of challenge and difficulty, a different flavor that we're experiencing now. And I love that um, this 8th century text, which is originally written by Shanti Deva, we have the updated commentary by Pema Chodron which gives us a bit more of the contemporary lens on it, especially kind of a psychological lens on it. And in the first three chapters, the real emphasis of this text is on how do we get excited about dedicating our lives to wake up for the sake of all beings? Because for many people, that prospect seems overwhelming, unappealing, unobtainable. And these first three chapters, there's a bit of a intention or a hope that we start to see clearly, this is the only sane option. Like anything else we do while we live in this world with this suffering is like distraction, right? denial, right? And giving ourselves this real kind of uh, invitation to see why waking up for the sake of all beings is, is the only, only thing that we can hope will help motivate us to continue our practice, to deepen our practice, and thereby show up for others. So I, I often think of these practices as really helping to clarify our intention and motivation and also tenderize the heart a bit. So often we do our best to you know, avoid the suffering we don't need to directly be in touch with. We'd like to, we have enough in our life and with those we love, and we don't necessarily open the door to a lot more. And here in this kind of heart laboratory, we, we do, we open our heart and we start to practice with what it's like to have an open heart for all beings. This part of the chapter I, I really love um, that we're gonna dive into. We started a little bit last week, and this is on what's called merit and also dedicating the merit and even if you've only been to one other meditation sit, likely you've heard this term merit. It's often that we start with intention and we close with merit. And intention has a lot to do with really helping us see and understand why we are here. The core motivation or intention for this book and, and for many, especially Tibetan Buddhist practices is that awakening for all beings. So that piece is covered. But the merit is a little bit more elusive. Like what is, what is merit and why are we giving it away? And I love the description um, that, you know, Trungpa Rinpoche talks about merit. He says that um, accumulating merit depends on letting go of our possessiveness altogether. It cannot be done with a business deal mentality. It's not like putting money in a savings account for our retirement years. Merit is only accumulated by letting go. And so from this point of view, sharing the merit means surrendering completely with an attitude of letting whatever happens, happens. So there's, there's this way that dedicating the merit of our practice means we recognize that meditating has a, has a value. There's some kind of experience that happens when we meditate that's of benefit. And instead of feeling good about it at the end of our practice, like, oh yeah, I went to a sit tonight. There was all these other people. I'm probably doing really good. My, you know, I'm increasing in my virtue. I'm doing really great. At the minute after we, we have our meditation practice, we dedicate it. 
may the benefit of this practice help all beings. And so we can dedicate the merit essentially of, of anything. And tonight we'll be talking about really the hard things for us to let go of our body, our possessions, and this idea, especially of, um, you know, ownership over our body and how we want it to be. And then the possessions, it's, there's no problem having a possession, but kind of the ways that we, we get a little caught up in, um, in holding them close. And I think sometimes we can get the sense that these practices, they just are killing all the joy. Like, okay, can't enjoy anything. Got to give up everything that I love. The idea isn't to give it up, let it go, it disappears. The idea is that you transform how you relate to it, brings you less suffering and makes you more available. So you don't have to give up the jelly donut, right? Just down the street or give up, you know, your favorite old sweater, but the way that you relate to it gets transformed by this kind of dedication, this um, attitude or intention of dedicating so that's what we'll be working on um, tonight. And the last couple of weeks, we've been, we've been doing some practices related to compassion. In this book, we're always balancing the cultivation of a compassion that encompasses all beings. So this huge, expansive compassion. And then also creating kind of a flexible and pliant mind. So one that we can, you know, really see things clearly as they are, we have a sense of spaciousness and I'm going to return to a practice <clears throat> tonight that's more on the creating spaciousness and heightening awareness, but one that really helps us by, I'd say, calming the mind and giving us a place to focus. This is a practice called uh, mindfulness of phenomena. We've done it here. Some of you have done it here with me many times. And the idea is you start by really paying attention to one sense portal at a time. So paying attention to the sensations in the body, almost as though the analogy that I like to use, it's like there's a, a searchlight and you're putting that entire light just on sensation. Another way that it's traditionally taught is the withdrawal of senses. So imagining that the only sense that was available in your body. You had lost sight, you had lost smell, you had lost um, taste, the only thing you had, like with that kind of focused attention. And so that helps us really feel in sensation, but without any story. So in what is felt, letting it simply be felt. That's the, the simple instructions for this practice. And then we'll move on to noticing what can be heard right? As though we were withdrawing all of our senses except for, and we have a lot of help here, what can be heard. But we do it again, not with a kind of grasping or aversion, not with, oh, I like the sound of that car, but I really don't like the sound of that motorcycle. We let the sound kind of just be received, just as we would with the sensation and not having a preference or a judgment. We then move to the really subtle sense portals, so that smell or taste, and again, just receiving what is there. And as we're doing this, this kind of narrowing and sustaining of our focused attention can really help us feel at ease in the body. And there's a sense of awareness that kind of naturally builds as we're giving our mind one place to be, and then one place to be, and then one place to be. We'll do also sight. Um, so letting ourselves receive what can be seen. And then we move to the, the kind of greatest sense portal, which is that of the mind. And just as we are kind of receiving what is, what is being heard or what is being felt, we don't, you know, kind of turn our attention and awareness to mind and then go think about something. We are just like bringing awareness to the sense portal of the mind itself. And in that, thoughts may arise and fall just like whatever car is coming and going in our sound. And so we're practicing just this way of, you know, it's a real um, kind of a fine tuning of our attention and awareness. And actually I remember, yes, Ulysses. When we use sight, I was just curious, when we do it with eyes closed, we do it with our inner. That's one way. We're gonna actually, we'll, we'll tilt our head down 
because this way would be just too much information for most of us. So into the lap, and then you'll see shape and light and color, slight movement. You can do it with the eyes closed, it's so subtle um, that I think the traditional is with eyes open, yeah. And I remember, um, I think I see Brian on the screen many, many years ago, Brian, when at Osher Center, when uh, I first taught this practice. And I remember you were like, wow. And I, I always think about it because like it, it can, and you don't expect it. If it doesn't happen, no problem. But it can be such an interesting way to feel the spaciousness of mind after we've moved through these sense portals, partially because we've just settled our body, right? And it kind of gives us this um, calibrated uh, way to then experience, oh, what's this, what's this sense portal in which all the others arise? You know, like what is like perception? What is this experience of, of knowing that is our mind itself? So that's a little bit of the preamble. Um, and afterwards we'll do, you know, some question answer and discussion. And, you know, as always, when we're here in this beautiful container of the Dharma Collective, we are in community for tonight together. And this community is so enriched by each of you who are here, such a gift that we are giving by having our presence here. And also, you know, a bit delicate in the way that we can hold each other. And so when we are in conversation and reflection, just really remembering that this is a huge part of our practice is being in community. So when we're listening, doing compassionate listening, like as best we can with limited judgment um, or turn down or tune down judgment. And when we're speaking, also speaking compassionately, really considering what we're saying and its impact. And um, that's our, our contract for being able to be here together tonight and kind of collect in this unique way every week. How does that sound to everybody? Sounds good. Compassion warriors in action, not just in aspiration. <laughs> yes. <laughs> Wonderful. Okay. So fasten your Dharma seatbelt. I'm going to do mindfulness of phenomena practice. Don't worry, Coco can't do it wrong. It's part of the practice. So giving ourselves a moment to really find our meditation posture, to find the right seat. And let's begin by inhaling our shoulders up to our ears, and then exhaling them down our back. Trying that twice more, inhaling shoulders up and exhaling back. And then one more time. And really kind of feeling into the uprightness and pliancy of the spine. Inviting a softening through the front of the face and the chest and the belly. And these first couple moments of practice can be so interesting. We may find ourselves just kind of melting into a dullness or just a fuzzy sleepiness. If you notice this happening, really invite yourself to have the intention to find a brightness. And we may find a lot of busyness and agitation. And again, just using the power of our mind, set this intention to let the mind focus and to find rest in that focus all the to-dos and all the planning, 
all of that, we can invite to just go to the side for a little while. Let's begin by really giving ourselves a couple moments to settle the body, speech, and mind in their natural states. Finding a sense of stillness in the body. Whenever the mind gets carried away, just gently relaxing, releasing and returning. Inviting the body to find its stability and solidity. to help settle the inner speech. You can really notice and focus on the sensations of the body breathing. Feeling the breath from within the body and noticing the body as we are breathing in. Noticing the body and breath as we are breathing out. Such a subtle shift from noticing the body and saturating the body with attention and awareness to noticing how the breath breathes the body. We don't have to analyze it or understand it, but letting ourselves really find this rest in attending very closely to the sensations of breath in the body. And maybe for just a breath or two, we find this natural state of our inner speech where there's some silence. So stillness of the body, silence of the inner speech.
And we settle the mind in its natural state simply by feeling and sensing the warmth and openness that really can accompany being present here with the body, settling the inner speech. See if there's anywhere in the face <clears throat> where you can relax and release. And keep that softening through the chest and the belly. And finding this beautiful balance between the ease, relaxation, the vividness and brightness of our awareness. And having settled at least a bit the body, speech, and mind in their natural states, we bring forth the intention for our practice here tonight. And the Bodhisattva vow, the invitation is for us to open the heart to the possibility of awakening, becoming more available, present, for all beings who are suffering. And if we want to really expand the heart and open it, we consider no barrier, no boundary on the suffering that we want to include with this sense of care and dedication. Each and every being, not only now, but as long as there are beings. The aspiration is vast as space, allowing our mind and heart to open wider and wider. And then gently shifting our attention and awareness, allowing the aspiration and intention to be just completely absorbed within our heart. And we dedicate now our attention entirely to the field of tactile sensations in the body, shifting that searchlight of our attention into whatever can be felt and sensed in the body. And in what is felt and sensed, let it just be felt and sensed without any judgment, without any preference, without even needing to label what we're feeling. A 
as if this were the only way we could experience. We bring our full attention and awareness to sensations in the body. As we focus on the body, we may find areas that we don't like, find hard or difficult, as much as possible, bringing the sense of equanimity to our noticing. Not having a preference or judgment, just this pure noticing. And when we get caught up in a thought, memory or image, no problem. Just returning to this anchor. And again, as though our attention were a spotlight, then it was directed entirely to these sensations, whatever can be felt in the body. We gently shift the focus of our attention and awareness to the sense portal of sound. As though we could only experience through sound. In the sense that whatever we hear, we simply receive, not leaning out to try to understand what's being heard placing a label on it, and as much as possible without any judgment or preference. And what is heard, letting it simply be heard.
Noticing what it's like to sustain attention, even when there are less sounds or when sounds come and go. Redirecting our attention and awareness, shifting that spotlight to the sense portals of smell and taste. This might be quite subtle, maybe a little bit of scent from your clothing or shampoo, maybe just even the sense of moisture in the mouth or tea or dinner. But again, bringing this kind of awareness and attention that doesn't need to know why or how, doesn't have a preference, liking or not liking. Just this full saturation mindfulness to the phenomena that can be experienced through smell and through taste. And then shifting once again, and now lowering the head so that the gaze would be down towards the lap, the chin towards the chest. Even before we blink our eyes open, taking into consideration what it could be like to experience the sense portal of sight for the very first time without our judgments and appraisals, just seeing. And gently blinking the eyes open. And letting what is seen simply be seen. Receiving the colors and shapes, subtle movement.
And gently blinking the eyes closed, returning the head to resting evenly on top of the neck. And shifting now to the sense portal of the mind, to our awareness and everything that arises within the space of this awareness. Without judgment or preference for what arises and without energizing a thought or image or memory, really letting the attention and awareness be upon awareness as opposed to what arises and falls. Relaxing in the body, relaxing in the mind. Yet finding a vividness, an awakeness to this observation, is being with the sense portal, living through the sense portal of the mind. It doesn't matter how many times you get caught up or carried away. Let's keep coming back to the sense of really experiencing just what we can experience by resting in awareness.
And then allowing the aperture of our senses to broaden, feeling and sensing whatever we can experience in the body, while also making space to feel and experience through the sense portal of sound, taste, smell, whatever we can see even behind the eyelids, the visual sense portal. And allowing that to be held and hosted in spacious awareness. Thank you for your practice. So <clears throat> make a little space here for any questions or reflections on that practice. If you're in the room, please use our fancy new cordless mic. And if you're online, raise a hand. What is anybody noticing right now? What are you feeling the presence of or the absence of? Did it shoot us too far into space? It's a very good bodhisattva activity to share and ask questions. So if you want to get extra, yes, thank you. Mm. Mm. You know, it's like the body getting like, oh, I hear that sound and letting it go and getting used to it. And then to a point where I just like forgot about sound and then I disappear. Then I heard you say something else and yeah, it was all over. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, thank you. Yeah, I think sound is such a powerful one to practice with because no matter where you go in the world to practice and get isolation, it's going to be like some sound you don't want. And so to be able to work with it, and I do find it such a good parallel for understanding how we want to be with the spaciousness of mind. So with sound, you know, the sound can come and go away. And the same with our thoughts, but usually we like, we, you know, we like jump in the car with them and go. But if we can let sound come and go, we can let thoughts come and go. So it's a really nice, um, yeah, way to practice that ability to have something in our awareness, like sound, but not energize it or fixate on it. 
Yeah. Yes, Lucas. Welcome back. Mm. I guess initially I didn't really figure out there was something wrong with the smell. I'm not, not even smelling the lotion on my face. But then, uh, you know, I knew it was there, but I couldn't smell it, right? And then um, after a little bit of time, it seemed like I was getting these, you know, uh, like individual people or like specific scents like within each breath, which mm. was nice. Kind of, you know, it's like, oh. It, you know, there's a smell of perfume next to me, and <laughs> it's like, but then when I took my next inhale, it was somebody else that I smelled, you mm. know, and it was just like, kind of these isolated, which, which, which was lovely. I mean, mm. it was. Mm -hmm. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Okay. <laughs> yeah, yeah, sure. Take it. <laughs> 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 Thank you. Yeah. I mean, I think um, I think it's I think we we so preference very few of our um, sense portals, right? Like even like pretty much we believe everything we see, and if we can see something, we're gonna latch onto it, and also sound. And so to even try to develop a bit more of these other sense portals is so interesting. Um, yeah, it's such a different um, muscle we can exercise and, and such a good way to practice mindfulness because we have our senses with us wherever we go, so we can use them. Yeah, thank you. Um, I, I really like it, it just you know, going into sound and just being aware of all these sounds that I was just taking for granted. But I wonder if you could talk a little bit more about the mind as sense portal mm -hmm. because I just got a little stuck up. Yeah, what was it like for you? Um, I just I felt like my mind just won't shut up, and um, I just was trying to, I guess I didn't know how to get to that place of the mind. I mean, I guess it's, a, it's aware, it's trying to be aware, but I yeah, it's yeah, like basically. Yeah, and you know, we've done some of these awareness of awareness practices in, in like last month and, and before, and I think it's, an, it's like another way into that. Mm -hmm. Um, into that sense of awareness because the idea is that it is you know and, and I like this idea that you know mind or perception is a sense portal and to give it that um, designation could be an interesting way to try and step into it mm -hmm. no matter what it's always hard to step into awareness you're like where like what how like what is that and so this is, you know, just one way to do it. Mm -hmm. And it is funny because, like, the minute you think about it, you're no longer there, mm -hmm. right? And yet it's so easy, especially, you know, because we practice later in the day here, so hard for it to not feel dull, you know? So it's hard to kind of have that experience. And I think it's really nice when we can note and pay attention to when we are experiencing awareness throughout the day. And so that it doesn't feel so foreign, like, what is it like to be there? Mm -hmm. So I'm curious, is there a time you can think of where kind of maybe had that sense of awareness where there wasn't necessarily an object or a target or a thing, but you weren't falling asleep? Well, it's sort of easier for me when we first started and I was just feeling my feet on the ground and maybe it was sort of the self-consciousness of turning, trying Towards. to imagine my mind. I, mean, I think I overthought it. I think yeah. It yeah. yeah, and then, you know, I guess it would be wonderful to see if, you know, in the coming weeks, you could imagine mm -hmm. finding those little, like, gaps, you could call them, mm -hmm. where our awareness isn't totally caught up in, in some thing or some activity. Yeah. Yeah. Thank you. Um, when we were doing the awareness of awareness mm -hmm. at the end, I was having a hard time getting into that and actually, um, I don't know, not doing as much of the like doing of the mind. Mm. Um, and I was like thinking about like, oh, should I, you know, try a different entry to the awareness of awareness? There's a few other ones that like are easier for me to access. Maybe I should try that. And then, you know, the bell goes off. I'm like, oh, dang it, okay, like lost the chance. And um, really feeling like I wasn't like 
doing the meditation well you know mm. you have those like evaluations yeah um but then afterwards I noticed that like my field of vision was a lot wider and mm. a lot like softer not so like pin yeah um so it was just interesting to notice like the experience of the practice while I was doing it versus the effects of it afterwards yes. and like still having that impact so yeah good noticing yeah and it can you know it's, the mind is so tricky Um, it can be really hard to not get in the way. And then it is, you know, when we get a little more familiar with awareness, we kind of want direct access, like want to get back there. And so, yeah, I can see the appeal. And, and yeah, it is, I, I did notice in the room, it felt like there was um, definitely a shifted energy after the practice. So even when it is a struggle, there can be actually some of that benefit. So it's good to notice. Yes, please. How did Coco like the practice? Yeah, she loved it. Yeah. <laughs> I felt such an emptiness mm. in my head. Silence. I could hear you. <laughs> but it was like relaxation mm. the best relaxation of my life mm. uh, really it was like opening up mm. and having a white space mm. and a white space yeah so um, it was a wonderful meditation for mm. me this time I'm so glad thank yeah thank you beautiful yeah Counterpoint. <laughs> no, I I like wish the body wasn't first mm. because it's I can't like, um, and then I just spend the entire meditation like trying to. I don't know. I'm just like, how can my body not hurt? Like it's just it hurts so much, yeah. and so I notice like, uh. You know, when we did sound, like, I don't have issues with sound. Like, I welcome sound. Mm. The louder it is, the easier it is to, like, transfer the attention to the experience to sound from my body. And that's yeah. lovely. Like, yeah. And even when there's no sound, it's sort of a deafening. Like, I feel like I can hear the air or something. I don't know what I'm hearing. Like, yeah. some sort of ambient white noise. And that's really lovely for me if I can focus on that instead of my body I kind of like wonder if like focusing on the body is like super overrated or something like <laughs> can I just skip that part um because I'm fine with the sound love the smell seeing was whatever um and then when it came to the mind like it just I just go back to the body and I'm just mm. like really shifty 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 mm. like how can I make this stop how can I yes and I was just like moving the entire time today which is funny because like this morning when I sat I didn't really move at all and I was totally fine yeah um but I think because I was also in my brain a lot so I wasn't focused on my body at all mm. it's like it wasn't there right um which is great <laughs> but yeah. then I'm just thinking about work for 25 minutes and time to get up yeah um so I yeah you, I, feel I like, hope you bill for that time uh yeah I should bill for that time <laughs> <laughs> But I, yeah, yeah. I mean, I think you know. I'm curious because um, the body being in pain is something that all of us will experience, or all of us do experience, right? And and I do think some part of practice is inviting us to move towards, even if we can't get there, like reducing that like aversion to the pain. Right, because if it was the pain that you couldn't tolerate, you know, then and like really required you to go to the hospital, you'd go to the hospital, right? And then the pain that, you know, many of us who suffer with chronic pain experience, it's a signal that's so strong that something's wrong, even if like, yeah, it's wrong, but it's actually not immediately wrong and, and not, not going to harm us. And working with that, like, 
you know, what is it called, like the second arrow or like the charge with it. That, that is a big part of the practice. It might not be in, enjoyable or it might not feel successful, but it is, I think, you know, that without judgment and without preference, it's very hard to do um, with anything. You know, I, I hear, I definitely hear you, no pun intended, that the sound is easier mm -hmm. um, because even the loud ones, it's not impacting your body, right? Though it, when it's really obnoxious sound, it can feel kind of painful, right? We're like, oh. It has it, to be really extreme for me to really feel extreme, that yeah. way. Like nothing we've ever experienced in this room. Yeah. yeah, yeah. But that like the contraction against the sensation um, of pain. And I think you're right. Like, could we do and have an amazing meditation practice without focusing on the body? A hundred percent. You know, it, it's not a required practice. And yet I do think there is a lot to be learned and gained with kind of softening around that reaction to the pain in practice. Because that is, you know, all of us have um, many things in our life that were painful that we don't get to shift or change. And that, that whole process of like, how do I kind of soften the, the tightness of the reactivity towards it? That's, I think, such a big piece of, of this work. So it, it a little bit is like an attitudinal shift with the pain and okay, like may I also use this pain for, you know, the purposes of waking up. The pain is showing me, the pain is helping me see where I'm stuck, where I just don't and can't like really um, be with what's here. And, you know, like it's interesting. What a joyous message to get to carry. <laughs> yeah, but like it's, it's, you know, otherwise you're not, it's like, it's not that it's not making you in more pain. Like if I thought that practicing was making you in more pain, I'd say stop. But like the pain is there. You're distracting by being ruminating about work, right? Which is one way to not have pain, but it's still there. But to directly be with the body, like how do we be with what is here and is painful for us? You know, I think that's such an essential question of, of cultivating these practices. And a lot of it, I mean, 100% of it is, is this like mind, mindset or this like shift of how we meet what's difficult. Also, the rumination that gets me out of the body pain is also not, not painful. Right. Like it's just pain on top of pain. Yeah. Yeah. So, I mean, it really is like, what kind of pain? And my teacher, you know, do you want, my, te my teacher says this great line, you know, um, the options aren't between, you know, something, a way to have our life that's like good, and then a way to have our life that's hard. There's just stupid hard and hard, <laughs> like, <laughs> right? Like, how are we going to, how are we going to practice with the reality? Not that there aren't joys and there aren't good things, but like reacting, the reaction to pain is such a key piece of it. So I'll be very curious how, you know, how your interest or curiosity in the body pain can support your practice. Yeah, Thanks. thank you. Yeah, Belinda or back here. Great questions, everybody. Thank you. I'm just so appreciative that people, this is what people are talking about, is like this idea of mind, because I've been really, um, trying to make sense of it and ruminating on it. I read the um, Thich Nhat Hanh's um, full awareness of breathing, the mm. sutras, and one of the, and I've been practicing it every day, and one of the things I say, and every time I say it, it's like, what the hell does that mean? <laughs> and it's like, um, so you start with, you know, feeling sensations, and then you get to, um, I'm aware, breathing in, I'm aware of the mind, breathing out, I'm aware of the mind. And then instead of saying, I calm the mind, it's like, I make the mind happy. And the way <laughs> that it was explained what the mind is, it's, it's our, it's not us, it's not our feelings, but it is feelings. It's not sensations, but it's how we interpret it. Like, so I feel like, like, um, I'm sorry, I forget your name. Sylvia, like the way that Sylvia was explaining it, like tonight, I feel like I kind of went up above it. Mm. Um, and and was just experiencing this like expansiveness of being like, so it's it's not me, it's not a sensation, it's kind of like everything. Yeah. Um, okay, and then for, I had that for a second, and I was like, oh. <laughs> <laughs> and then then I kind of came like I make my mind happy, so that's one of the things that mm. you say, and I'm like, 
well, how do I do that? You yeah. know, like if I just don't, I still can't wrap my mind around the idea yeah. of what mind is. Yeah. You know? So it's like I, you get, I get like a little baby understanding, but then it, whoosh, yeah. it's gone. You know? I wouldn't, I wouldn't call it the baby, but it is yeah. the, it's the glimpse, right? Mm -hmm. And I think most of us, we experience these glimpses of mind. And um, I love that. It's so Thich Nhat Hanh, I make my mind glad. So, that's so sweet. It's like the glad heart. Um, yeah, I think that the, it's so interesting to have to relax into the definition of like, what is mind? You can't effort and you can't think too hard with it. And then, you know, that feeling of up and out, um, you know, according to the traditions and what I have experienced myself, when we actually have a, a different experience of our body when we're in different states of awareness and that the awareness body is feels larger than our body. So there are these kind of signifiers or clues of when we are experiencing what, it, what would be called the natural state of mind. So, and I would actually consider that bliss. So I think maybe that's the make happy. It's a little more dualistic, but like that the natural state of mind of, is bliss. Most of us are like, are you kidding me? <laughs> like, have you seen this mind? But it is what you're describing. Like we get glimpses of that natural and by natural, it's not, this is how it is all the time. It's, this is kind of the innate potential of mind. Um, and I, I, for me, it's it's helpful to think mind about like I, I feel like knowing, knowing as opposed to thinking, doing, feel. You know, it's like a there's a knowing, like an essential knowing, um, of experience, and uh, yeah, and I yeah I I love and I do think it's interesting the how these different practices can show us because it is a lot like you know, the, the 12 or however many blind people or um, people who don't have sight with the elephant. And each one of them is on a different side of the elephant and describing an entirely different experience. Like, oh, it's rough and it has fur and like, oh, it's very smooth or, oh, there's like, you know, depending on where you are. And I think there's so many um, ways to experience the, and ways into the mind and facets in some ways that it's good to try a, a bunch of different pathways. The mind though, isn't an elephant. That's a bad analogy because <laughs> it is, you know, it does have this kind of unified quality that no matter which way in we can experience it. But uh, yeah, thank you. Yeah. Okay. Oh yeah, there's one last question here. Yeah. Um, when you were talking about chronic pain, I, I thought of like the addiction of thinking mm -hmm. and how when I'm meditating and especially the last one we were looking at the mind, like I was telling myself to stop thinking and then there's a constriction in my mm. temples, like I feel that. Mm. I just wanted to know for practices like that, how yeah. you, how, what, what is that note, like what is that watching of it? Do you, do you let yourself spiral and go down and just acknowledge it? Or do you like actively try to stop it yeah. and constrict yeah. it? Yeah, thank you. And what was your name? Kara. Kara. Um, I really, I really like the first thing you said too, of like recognizing the kind of compulsiveness of thinking, mm -hmm. right? Like, mm -hmm. wow. Yeah. Like that is such a strong pull for most of us. It gives us a sense of security. We can control things, we can change things. I can think about them, I can fix them, I can analyze them. Um, and then in terms of like, how are we with, you know, there's a whole variety of these practices of settling the mind in its natural state or awareness of awareness or simply aware. And one of the metaphors often given is, you know, when you're, if you're observing the mind and thoughts, so that'd be kind of awareness of thoughts. It's almost as though they come out from behind a stage curtain and then we let them go back behind the curtain. So you're, you're observing from the audience, but you're not like merged with them. And so the whole goal is to like, you know, cognitively diffuse ourselves. What happens, thoughts arise and we're in them and there's like no space. So if we can even have that amount of space, watching them go by, 
making them feel less personal, like not my thoughts, just thoughts that are coming. Though, of course, there are personal content, they're no one else's thoughts, but just that, you know, ability to watch them come and go. And then the reality is, of course, like a good sticky one comes and it pulls us away. And then really noticing what's it like to release and return and where is it you're returning to? Like the whole time, the curiosity is so important. Like, oh yeah, who just noticed, <laughs> right? That I was thinking, who pulled me back? And then resting there, resting there, right? And just that interesting piece of like, how can we observe um, the experience of our mind without getting completely lost in the thoughts? And, you know, this very like philosophy 101 that you aren't your thoughts. Like, I find that to be a revelation every day. Like, oh my God, right, there's not just thoughts, there's more. And like, whenever we get, you know, a glimpse of that or an experience of that, it can strengthen our ability to feel that non thought quality of mind. Yeah. Yeah. Thank you. All right. Wonderful questions comments. So let's move on to a bit more uh, of merit here. We are page 59 for anyone who's interested. Um, yeah. I want to I want to read again this this piece here that I, I love this is from the point of view sharing merit means surrendering completely with an attitude of letting whatever happens happen. If it's better for me to have pleasure, let me have pleasure. If it's better for me to have pain, let me have pain. We aren't collecting anything for ego to hold on to. It's the opposite. Um, and you can, with merit, you know, so this practice here of, you know, developing the ground or establishing ourselves to get ready for these teachings that'll transform the mind. Um, dedicating our merit, we can do that generally, or we can also do that specifically. And so in the next couple verses, it's specifically directed towards um, people who are sick, um, people who are struggling. So I, I really love these, these verses, just in kind of the emphasis on what if I could donate all of my life energy of who I am, what if I could like offer that entirely to other beings? So it's for all those ailing in the world until their every sickness has been healed. May I myself become for them the doctor, the nurse and the medicine itself. Raining down a flood of food and drink, may I dispel the ills of thirst and famine. And in the ages marked by scarcity and want, May I myself appear as drink and sustenance. So really just, um, yeah, this real, you know, this real heart's aspiration and then this real specific of, you know, there's scarcity in the world, there is danger in the world, there's difficulty in the world. May I show up as all these different manifestations. Um, for sentient beings poor and destitute, may I become a treasure ever plentiful and lie before them closely in their reach a varied source of all that they might need. My body thus and all my goods besides and all my merits gained and to be gained, I give them all away, withholding nothing to bring about the benefit of beings. And yeah, it's interesting because then what I love here is Pema Chojin brings up this really wonderful word um, that uh, in Tibetan called Shempa, you might have heard her talk about that before Shempa. And this idea, it's, it's really, it's the attachment to our possessions. It's, um, it's, she calls it the charge behind our emotions. Um, and so this idea of like, really in even just these words and aspirations, like I would give up anything for all beings to be free. Whoa. And now I'm huge. Sorry, that's disturbing. <laughs> I would give up looking at myself in real time for all beings. I'll just close my eyes. Um, <laughs> thank you. I don't want to deal with my with that at this moment. Um, yeah, and it's like the uh, she calls Shempa 
like this right when we get hooked like a nonverbal she says a nonverbal tight or tightening or shutting down um it's like right when we get like hooked or feel that charge of like i don't want it i don't like it Ugh, get it like mm. but the funny thing is even though we don't want it we're like hooked on it <laughs> right it's like that dual experience and this like shampa is like especially tight for us around our possessions, our body, and, and what um, Pema Trojan says and Shanti Deva is saying is our merit, our good fortune. We don't want to give up what's good in our lives. We don't want to like offer it to, we want to, you know, accumulate and, and have the benefit for ourselves. Um, so it's, it's this idea that um, the journey, he says, Pema says here, the journey to enlightenment involves shedding, not collecting. It's a continual process of opening to surrender, like taking off layer after layer of clothes until we're completely naked with nothing to hide. But we can't just pretend, making a display of disrobing, but then putting on everything, back everything on when no one's looking. It has to be genuine. Um, and so this idea of like, you know, how do we shed everything and like really kind of hold and like stay in that stance and not again because we have to because of what it shows us and there's a great um story in here of these tibetan masters so marpa um was a translator who'd gone to live um in india uh, with naropa and so naropa was it was his teacher and marpa had brought with him from tibet like this little bag of gold dust as an offering so he gets up to offer to his teacher, you know, thank you for the teachings. And But Naropa, because there's a belief in the Tibetan tradition, once you've reached a certain level of attainment, you can read minds, essentially. It's one of the cities. And so he sees in Marpa's mind, oh, he's holding some gold dust back. He still has some in his pocket. He's like, give it. Like, <laughs> give it all. And then he takes it and throws it into the air. And Marpa's like, and in that moment, he experiences true ability to receive the teachings. So he had to let like it all like be shown what it's like to let it all go, let it all go like, and in that he saw like, wow, he would let something so valuable go because there's something more valuable. Mm -hmm. So like, what does letting it all go actually do, right? It like really opens the heart. Um, and helps us work with that shempa of like, I can't let it go. There's not enough. There's not enough. And so I'm not saying like throw all your gold dust or crypto or whatever <laughs> into the air. Um, yeah, you should definitely donate it somewhere good if you're going to do that. But um, it's more like what does that loosening of the feeling of shempa, of the grip, like what would that do for practice? really like what are we prioritizing what's more important to us um, <laughs> and he says it was a moment of shock and disbelief for marpa but a moment of great opening he became an empty vessel and could receive the blessings without any reservations until he gave up everything self-importance blocked his way um, yeah and so this the way that um these next verses, the dedication is really like, I am going to give everything away because I know that is, that's the way, that's the mindset needed for these teachings to arise. And so in, in verse 312, Nirvana is attained by giving all. Nirvana, the objective of my striving, everything therefore must be abandoned, and it is best to give it all to others. This body I have given up to serve the pleasure of all living beings. Let them kill it and beat it and slander it and do whatever they desire. And though they treat it like a toy or make it the butt of every mockery, my body has been given up to them. There's no use now to make so much of it. And, and Pema says here that when she first read these verses on the body, like let them you know, do whatever they will with it, that she was you know, very upset um, when she thought it was going too far. And this idea is kind of, you know, feeding into some, you know, over intense feelings of kind of negating the self. But when she, she then kind of likened it to people who are willing to give their life 
in order to put a, a cause forward for social justice, for example, like willing to receive, you know, the tear gas or the whatever, right? People who are really willing to let go of the attachment onto their body for what truly matters for the sake of all beings, that that to her made more sense. And this idea, um, I love here that she says, uh, the body is a precious vessel, our ship for reaching enlightenment. But if we spend all of our time painting the decks, we'll never leave port. And this brief opportunity will be lost. And actually in coming chapters, there's a bit more um, that Shanti Deva says about right relationship with body. And I know this has been true in many different periods of history, but man, are we obsessed with our bodies. Like it's insane, right? If we put the amount of attention and like effort and, you know, all the creams, all the lotions, all the exercises, all the, you know, worries about our bodies that we did with like our awakening, oh boy, <laughs> we'd be in, we'd have such a, we'd be in such a better place as a society, as a culture, as a world. Um, you know, not that it's, bad to take care of one's body, but this idea, like, uh, if we spend all our time painting the decks, we'll never leave port, right? And it can take up so much of our energy. Um, moreover, our body, like everything else, is impermanent and prone to death and decay. Perhaps it's time to see it for what it is and stop strengthening our shempa. Um, and so, you know, the our body provokes this kind of attachment and this um, tightening, but also possessions. Um, when we're afraid of losing them, breaking them, or never getting enough, it doesn't have to do with the things themselves, but the charge behind being afraid they'll be taken away. Um, so she says here that to get hooked in this way is completely unreasonable, as if the objects of our desire could provide security and lasting happiness. So it's, again, the invitation isn't stop enjoying things and stop having things. It's really be clear about your relationship with your things and your objects. It's nice, like I, lo I love my bicycle. Um, I'd be sad if it got stolen or destroyed. You know, it gets me places, it's fun. Um, it's a cool old vintage frame. Uh, all the things I enjoy about it. And yet it's not an ongoing source of my happiness and well-being. And if I, if I make it so, I contribute to my own misery. Partially because, you know, I really enjoy my bike when I'm riding it. It doesn't make me happy when I'm upstairs making tea, you know. And then if it, like, got to be even shinier and nicer than it is, it won't, like, increase my actual sense of contentment and well-being over time. So this idea of the strength of our attachments that we have to our body, to, to our possessions, it really gets us tight. It gets us bound up, it gets us pulled away from this aspiration to support all beings. But uh, essentially, it said that the easiest thing to let go of in this process of letting go is our possessions. The second easiest is our bodies but actually merit, letting go of merit is the hardest of all. And this is because in this way, it's thought of as really letting go of your good fortune, letting go of your good qualities, your pleasing circumstances, your comforts, your prestige, all these things that we've worked towards. Like, can we, again, it's symbolically, they can't really give away, you know, um, many of these things, our, our comforts, our prestige, those are things that it would be hard to kind of package and give to someone. But even that act of imagining dedicating, imagining that aspiration that all my merit, um, that helps us get closer. So then, mm -mm -mm. yeah, <laughs> yeah. And it's really um, the aspirations here is that, you know, any good benefit that we can create through our actions, our bodhisattva activities, like let it directly go to others who need it to be of benefit. So, and if, you know, in this last stanza of if someone is um, abusing or hurting, uh, 
if my body's been given up to them, makes for them to make use of it. Let so beings do to me whatever does not bring them injury, whatever they catch sight of me. Let this not fail to bring them benefit. If those who see me entertain the thought of anger or devotion, may these states supply the cause whereby their good wishes are fulfilled. All those who slight me to my face or do me any other evil, even if they blame or slander me, may they attain great fortune or enlightenment. Essentially, anything that someone does, whether they admire me, whether they put me down, may they think I'm just wonderful, may all of that lead towards their enlightenment. Like I, you know, I give all of that. I dedicate all of that. And it's, um, yeah, kind of this radical act of allowing whatever is becoming of you. It's, it's so hard to do. I, I have a friend who's um, in a difficult negotiation, you know, worried about losing, um, you know, quite a lot of profit to another person who's being irrational and unjust and really considering, you know, I, I, I suggested if they are going to ind indeed lose all this actual material possession to this person in this difficult negotiation, maybe dedicate it to them. Like, may this absolve, right, for them, this difficulty that, because you're going to lose it anyway. Like, do you lose it all like caught up and tight and pissed off that you got screwed over? Or do you say, like, may this also, you know, find its way to benefit them? So a lot of the mental gymnastics here with the, with, with the merit giving. And then, and then it gets into the real, the real, like, essence and beauty of, like, wishing all beings um, to have that sense of freedom because of the merit that you've offered. So these next three stanzas here are some of my favorites. Um, they are actually a beautiful way to do a dedication of merit. So I'm going to, yeah, I think I'll ask us to just come back into practice. And we will dedicate the merit of our time together. So imagining, which might be a leap of faith, that this time together generates some kind of value some kind of benefit. And that we could offer, dedicate. Just immediately, whatever it is we have gained here, offer it up to others. And considering, yeah, these and these simple prayers or aspirations in the Bodhisattva path. May I be a guard for those who are protectorless, a guide for those who journey on the road. For those who wish to go across the water, may I be a boat, a raft, a bridge. May I be an island for those who yearn for landfall, a lamp for those who long for light. For those who need a resting place, may I be a bed. May I be the wishing jewel, the vase of plenty, a word of power and the supreme healing. May I be the tree of miracles and for every being, abundance. Like the earth and the pervading elements, enduring as the sky itself endures, for boundless multitudes of living beings, may I be their ground and sustenance. Thus, for every living thing that lives, as far as the limits of the sky, may I provide their livelihood and nourishment until they pass beyond the bonds of suffering. Thank you, everyone. So next week, we'll make it to the second part here. 
And this is where we get into the paramitas. Some of you know these spiritual qualities. They're pretty classic across any Buddhist traditions. And you work with them one by one as kind of tools for waking up on the path. So that should be juicy.